Take your Bibles this morning. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, as we are continuing in this series through the letters to the churches uh, there in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 uh, this morning. You remember as we were doing this, you can look up on the screen here and the, the uh, banners behind me. You remember that in 2018, we are focusing on the theme of upward and outward. That we, as we have prayed and sought the Lord, that we think that the Lord is leading us in this direction. That, that we as a church body are to be focused upward toward him in, in worship and in prayer. Which is why we have these special prayer gatherings that we're, be, that we're going to be doing on Sunday nights. And I pray that you'll be there uh, tonight. Uh, but part of what we are doing in this upward focus is to take the word and look at the word and use God's word to examine our lives. And so that's why we are working through these letters to these seven churches in Revelation as we pray and think and read that Christ will examine us by his word and our lives will be transformed as we read these letters to the seven churches. Now we have the the letter to the church at Smyrna that we're going to be reading uh, today. And it's easy for us as we read these letters, to kind of hold these churches at a distance. Because these are, these are names that we don't often think about. Smyrna, Thyatira, Pergamum, other places like this. Places that we probably have no chance whatsoever of ever finding on a map. These are names that aren't familiar to us. And so for most of us, it's easy to stand back at a distance and think of these as just churches 2,000 years ago. I don't want us to hold these at a distance and look at this as something of a church so long ago. As we hear God's word, I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who are there in Smyrna. I want us to put ourselves in their shoes and hear God speaking to us through his word. As Christ was speaking to them, so also Christ speaks to us this morning. He speaks to us as Grace Baptist Church today. So I ask you to hear the word of the Lord. This is Christ himself speaking. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you'll have tribulation. Be faithful, though, unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is the word of the Lord Christ speaking to Smyrna, Christ speaking to us today. Now I said that this is, these are towns that we really don't know a whole lot about, most of us. This is Smyrna that we are talking about today. Uh, this is a town that is actually in modern day Turkey. It's one of only a couple of cities that are mentioned here in Revelation, these letters to the churches that actually continues to exist today uh, in modern day Turkey. Smyrna was a large city. Uh, it was a large port city, and so it had a lot of commerce coming through it. It was a city with a lot of pride in who it was. Smyrna was known as the first in Asia, uh, and so that's what they called themselves. And this was a city in which they had beautiful works that they had built all throughout the city. It was a city that was known for its civic pride. They claimed themselves as the birthplace of Homer, who was the most important writer in all of ancient Greece. And so they would say, he was here Look at who we are. We are the first in Asia. They were actually the first city to build a temple to the goddess Roma. So the goddess Roma was kind of the personification of everything that there is about Rome. And so this was the first city to do that. This was a city also that won out in a competition against a lot of other cities to see who would get to build a temple to honor Tiberius the emperor. And so they won out on that. So this is a a city that is a cultural center, is a large town that takes pride in who they are as Romans. People who will worship the gods, people who will bow down and worship the emperor, 
And this is the city in which Jesus is sending this letter to. Now here we have this little church in the midst of this massive pagan area that worships all the Roman gods and even bows down and offers incense to the, to the Roman emperor, calling him a god himself. But there in the midst of that town, God had done a work. Now, we don't know all the details about exactly when the church was formed in Smyrna, but what we, what we speculate is Paul, likely in one of his mission trips, he shared the gospel there or somebody else close to Ephesus because Smyrna is just about 35 miles north of where Ephesus was that likely the gospel went forward through Paul's ministry and God began to do a work raising up a people there in this town in the midst of this total pagan area. Now it talks about us putting ourselves in the shoes of these people. It's hard for us to think about. 2,000 years ago, this church, we don't know the people that are in there, but I want us to do that. Because the people who were there in that church, this small band of people that God had brought together, were people just like me and you. We've got families with the mom and dad striving just to provide for their kids. I'm sure there are teenagers there who are, who are living and doing what they're supposed to do maybe at that time. We've got senior adults who are there. These people that God has brought together. And so 2,000 years ago, there they were, separated from us by a long time. But just like us, they were people who were called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. So I want you to hear, I want you to hear this morning about the church at Smyrna and realize that God is speaking to us as well. This is a church that was walking through suffering, walking through hardship, and yet Christ's words ring out to us today. So I want to begin this morning to looking at the text and starting out by hearing the report that Christ gives about the church. So again, look at the text with me. As we hear the report that Christ gives about what is happening at the church. It says there in verse 9, I says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So it starts out by telling us that Christ here, giving this report about the church, he says, I know your tribulation. That's just a word, a generic word that means the troubles and hardships that they are facing. And so then what Jesus does next is lay out what those tribulations are. So the first thing that we see here specifically about what they're suffering is that they are experiencing poverty. Now, I I know when we think about poverty, sometimes it's, it's hard for us to grasp our minds around what that might mean. But when it's talking about poverty here, it's not talking about somebody who missed a meal one time in a week or maybe they, they struggled to pay their rent one time a month of, uh, you know, last year. This is a people who are struggling with true poverty in which they did not sometimes know where their next meal would come from. They did not have many possessions and they had nothing really to claim as their own. We're talking about a people who are living in total poverty. Now, it may be that some of this poverty that they're experiencing is because of their station in life. When we look back at the early church and and acts and records of the early church, we see that the early church grew a lot among the poor in the Roman Empire. But I don't think that what is happening here is that the church of Smyrna is just a group of poor people that was saved out of their poverty. I think that they are in poverty specifically because they are followers of Christ. You see, living in this time period, most of the jobs that the people in the church would have would have something to do with the trade, some kind of trade that they would do. But in order to really make a living in any kind of trade, you'd have to be a part of a trade guild, a group of people who had banded together and they were kind of like a union of the time. But the problem was is that all these trade guilds were centered around the gods of Rome and around the emperor. So in order to be a part of one of these guilds, one of these unions, you would basically have to bow allegiance to the emperor and you would have to claim the Roman gods. If you, if you couldn't do that, a lot of times you would, you would not have the opportunity of even being able to really have a job for yourselves. So starting out, strike one against these people in Smyrna is that it's unlikely that they could even really make a living for themselves, a lot of them, because they would be expelled from the trade guilds that they were going to be a part of. So that's strike one against them and what they are experiencing. But the second thing that mentions is that they were experiencing slander by the Jews in the city. 
Now, it says here that they, uh, that they were uh, being slandered of those who say that they're Jews or not, but are synagogue of Satan. Oftentimes, during this time period, the Romans would allow the Jews a certain amount of freedom. They would be allowed to have their synagogues. They would be allowed to continue in their, their normal way of life. And the Romans, at, at the first, looked at Christians as just kind of this, this spinoff of Judaism. But what happened was, as the Jews began to get more and more riled up against these Christians in Smyrna, they began to speak against those Christians. And then the Romans would say, oh, wait a second, this isn't the same group that we're thinking of. These are people who actually aren't like us, and so what we need to do is we need to suppress them. And so when we hear here that the, the Christians are being slandered, it's not like somebody looking at you saying, I, I don't like that guy. I just don't like that fellow. I don't like the way he talks, the way he looks, the way he walks. I'm not going to be his friend. That's not the kind of slander that we're talking about. We're talking about slander that opposes them, that actually gets them in trouble probably with the Roman government. So now we've got the Roman government against them. So that's strike two. We've got their poverty. We've got the opposition that they're experiencing. And then take a look at the third thing that it says in the text there. In verse 10, it says, Don't fear what you're about to suffer. The devil's about to throw some of you into prison. So strike three that's coming against them is that they are getting ready to be thrown into prison. Now there are a lot of things that we don't know exactly about what's being said here. We don't know exactly... Uh, if the 10 days that are mentioned here is literal or if it's figurative. A lot of times, numbers in Revelation are figurative. They're symbolic. I tend to think that this is symbolic of a short time that they're going to be thrown into prison. So we don't know exactly how long that some of them are going to be thrown into prison. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen at the end of those 10 days when that they're in prison. But what we do know is that the Roman idea of prison is a lot different than ours. Let's say that I were to go off and do something I shouldn't do. Brought before a judge, I'm placed uh, before him, and I'm convicted of something. I'm put into prison for a certain amount of time, and I have a certain amount of time that I'm to serve that pays back my debt to society for what I've done. The Roman idea of jail wasn't like that. So if you're thrown in a Roman jail, it's not for you to pay back your debt to society. It's usually for one of three reasons. It's number one, that they're putting you in there to to uh, cause you to sweat it out until you'll confess to something else. Or they put you in there uh, to just await the date of your trial. Or the third reason is that they're putting you there until the day that they execute you. So more than likely what's going on here is that these Christians at Smyrna have been in poverty, they've been slandered, now they're getting ready to be thrown in prison, and a lot of them are probably going to be executed for their faith. So we've got strike three against them. Everything it seems to be that could possibly be going wrong against them. So those are are some things we're not exactly sure about their imprisonment. But what we do know about their imprisonment is what the text says. So look back with me at what it says there in verse 10. It says, don't fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw you, some of you, into prison. And here's the reason. Listen, this is what Scripture says is the reason. That you may be tested. The reason they're going to be thrown into prison is so that they will be tested. Now, I think of testing like a fire. If there is a blazing fire, that blazing fire can can destroy and consume. An arsonist who sets a fire, his job, what he is trying to do at that point is to consume everything that that blaze is going to take up and destroy So a fire can function that way, but a fire can also function in a different way if it's under control. A fire that is under control and used for a right purpose can be used to refine. You know, you can take that same blazing fire, bring it under control, aim it at gold that is impure, and knowing what you're doing, you can actually remove the impurities from that gold so that you're left with pure gold before you. Because a fire can actually function also to refine and to make pure. And so what we have going on are these Christians following Christ but suffering. And some of them are getting ready to be thrown into prison. And Satan's purpose for this to happen is to test them, to consume them. John 10.10 says that, that Satan only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's desiring to crush them and destroy them in their suffering. 
caused them to curse God and die. But that is not Christ's purpose for their suffering. Christ's purpose for the suffering that they are going through is to cause them to be refined, to take them and to burn away any impurity and cause them to fix their eyes entirely on him and see that Christ is better than the suffering that they are experiencing, to see that Christ is worth it and so be refined by Christ for his purposes. Now, I don't know about you, but when we hear the situation that these Christians are in, it, it may be hard for us to identify with them. We hear about the suffering that they're going through, how they're poor, and that some of them may be dying. Our instinct is to pity them for all that they're going through and our heart to go out for them because of what they're experiencing. They're losing everything here following Christ. But that's not how Jesus sees it. Jesus does not see it as them losing everything, but Jesus sees it as them gaining everything. Christ says that these Jews that have spoken against them, slandering them, that everything seems to be going okay for them, he says they are a synagogue of Satan, but you who are suffering, you are rich. You see where it says that in the text? Jesus says, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. I know the, tr the troubles that are coming to you and you dying, but you are rich. They may lose their homes, but they have Christ. They may lose their lives, but they have Christ. They may lose everything they have, but it is okay because they have Christ. This is good for us to see and understand. Because we become so easily confused about the, what the world says about success and the good life versus what God says about success and the good life. This world says to live for now, gain what you can have, avoid suffering at all costs so that you can have happiness and joy right now. The gospel says Christ has died, we will suffer for him, but it is worth it to give our lives for Christ. It is worth it, church. I want us to understand that what the world says about success is not what Christ says about success. So if we have Christ and we have nothing else, Christ looks at us and says, you are rich. We're rich, church. Do you understand that? Do you understand just how rich we are in Christ, that we have the fullness of the blessings of Christ poured out on us, our, our sin debt wiped away and made right with Christ? This is true riches. What a blessing that we have. So now, us today, 2,000 years later, we're putting ourselves in their shoes and thinking, now what does this have to do with us? These Christians who are experiencing so much, losing so much, yes, we have the same Savior, but, but a lot of us aren't walking through the same kinds of things. What does this have to do with us? We're not being imprisoned, most of us. We're not losing our possessions or life because we're following Christ, for most of us. So here's how, here's how I want to connect us to the church at Smyrna this morning. First of all, a connection that I point out to you is that, that we will suffer for the sake of Christ. That, that if you are a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, this is something that Christ has promised. It says that it is costly to follow after him. Just hear that again. Jesus tells us over and over and again in his word, it is costly to follow him. Take up your cross and follow after me. You may die. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Okay, come follow after me. It may cost you everything to follow him. This is, this is, this is the word of Jesus. Do we believe that? Do we believe what it says here that it does cost? But part of that cost is also suffering. Suffering in which we live in the midst of a fallen world, and the fallen world in which we live is heartbreaking at times. And, and I, I don't have to explain to you, you know the reality of what it means sometimes to walk through loss, to walk through pain, to experience heartache and grief, and sadness, uncertainty, anxiety. This is what it means to follow after Christ. These, these things will come in our lives. So, so we may not suffer in the exact same ways as, 
as these believers in Smyrna, but we walk in this world in which Satan wants to crush us in our pain, but desires to refine us in the suffering we go through. So yes, we, we hear the same message. Second of all, this has to do with us because we also will be opposed by a lost world. Paul says that the gospel is foolishness to this world. It cannot understand it. It seems like just absolute, utter nonsense and foolishness to the world. And so Jesus said, if they hate me, they'll hate you. This is the reality of following after Christ. We will be opposed. So we here in Somerset are not opposed like the church there at Smyrna, but it may come, it may come, the reality may come that we do experience opposition in the sense that you, can't, you have the choice of you will either do your job or you will be faithful to Christ and lose your job. It may come that you have the choice of will you stand for what is true or will you go to be in prison. The, these things may come. Historically, this is often what does come to believers. Will we stand true? Will we stand firm in the midst of suffering? So now, though, no, no matter the kind of suffering that we experience, the degree of it, the response that we're to have, the response that Jesus requires of me and you today is the same response that he expected of the church there in Smyrna nearly 2,000 years ago. So again, go back to the word of the Lord again. Revelation chapter 2, let's pick up in verse 10. The first response that Christ demands is do not fear. Look look there in verse 10. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Satan's going to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days you'll have tribulation. Do not fear. Now, let's be honest with ourselves for just a minute. That's a that's a pretty big statement. That's a pretty big statement that Jesus says to these believers. Hey, you're going through this poverty. People are opposing you. Uh, the Romans are probably uh, uh, on their doorstep, and some of you are going to be thrown in prison, and you may die. Je- and Jesus looks at them and says, don't fear. Don't fear what you're getting ready to go through. I, I don't know about you, but I think if we're honest, if I'm really honest looking at my life, there are times that we fear, don't we? We get anxious, we get worried, we fear. We fear the unknown. We fear what might happen to us. We fear what might happen to our kids. We we fear about our loved ones. Fear seems to be something that is so a part of human nature so often. But all throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, the consistent thing that we hear from Jesus, the consistent thing we hear from angels coming, the consistent thing we hear from God is saying, do not fear. So I want to ask you the question, how do we do that? How do you walk through the life that you live? How do you walk through the suffering that you go through? How do you walk through the uncertainty that you have in life and not fear? How do the people in Smyrna face imprisonment and maybe death and not fear? So let me give you a couple ways that we do that. First of all is remember that God knows what you're going through. This section begins with two of the most comforting words I can imagine. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9 there, what Jesus says. Look at it. Jesus says, I know. You hear that? Jesus says, I know. I know your tribulation. I know the things that you're going through. I know the heartache that you're experiencing. I know what's coming in your life. I know the loss that you feel. Now I want you to think about that for just a second. The the pain, the suffering, the anguish, and the fear that you sometimes feel. God looks at us and says, I know. I know everything that you're going through. And he loves us. This is amazing truth, church. Remember that he knows all of this. Second way to help us to not fear is to remind ourselves of the truth. Remind ourselves of the truth of who God is and what Christ has done. I read a a little book by Martin Lloyd-Jones recently. And and in this book, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's a preacher in England about 30, 40 years ago. Lloyd-Jones says that we need to Stop listening to ourselves, but start talking to ourselves. We need to stop listening to ourselves, 
but start talking to ourselves. Now, it sounds like he's saying the exact same thing two different ways, and it doesn't make sense. Here's what he means. When he says we need to stop listening to ourselves, well, here's what happens in the, in the core of who we are. We, we wake up, and we think about these unknown situations, and we start worrying. We, we're worrying, concerned, and our mind starts running through all the possibles, the what ifs, what if this happens, I don't know what's coming next. All these things are running through our minds. And so we're, we're listening to ourselves, get worked up and anxious and fearful, rather than speaking truth to ourselves. So rather than walking through this suffering and just listening to your sinful heart get worked up about what if and what might happen and I'm concerned I don't know what's going to happen with my kids all these things rather what we do is we preach the truth to ourselves we know what scripture says who is in control are we in control no who is the one who's in control God is on on the throne is he any less on the throne now than he was 2,000 years ago What about when you walk through that pain and suffering and anguish and that fear? Is God any less on the throne at that point? Absolutely not. He remains on the throne. So what we have to do is remind ourselves. Remind ourselves that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Remind ourselves that he is the one that is in control. Remind ourselves of what it says in verse 8. This is the words of the first and the last. I wonder why. I wonder why is it that Jesus spoke that way to this church? Why would he tell them these are the words of the first and last? He's the beginning and he's the end. He has everything from beginning to end in his hands. He's reminding them, you're walking through pain and suffering, but I'm here. I'm the beginning and the end. I've got everything. You don't have to worry about this. And he looks at them there. In the verse 8, he says, that I'm the one who died and came to life. You all... You all are getting ready to suffer. Some of you are going to be thrown into prison, possibly to the point of death. Here's who I am, Jesus says. I'm the one who came, lived, and died and suffered, and I rose again. He's reminding them that he has been there. And so whatever it is that you walk through, the suffering, anguish, and pain, Christ knows and identifies with. He has walked through more pain and suffering than we can ever understand. And he died and he rose again. And the great hope for every single believer is that no matter what comes to us, when we die, we will rise again. We have that hope. And so Jesus tells us, do not fear those who can kill the body, but fear the one who can kill the soul. So what's the worst that this world can do to us? The worst that this world can do to us is kill us. But Christ says that we die die to ourselves. Paul says it's gain when we die. And so the worst that can happen is that we die, but Christ wins and we're raised to be with him forever. This is good news for us. There is nothing that we have to fear in this world. Christ reigns. So response number one, don't fear. Response number two, be faithful unto death. Look at, look at verse 10 again. Don't fear what you're about to suffer. The devil is coming. He's going to about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. For 10 days you'll have tribulation. Here's his response, he says. Be faithful. Be faithful. Now, now those are two simple words. But in that, it encompasses everything that we're to do. Be faithful in following after Christ, even to the point of death. Be unmovably devoted to Christ no matter what comes in your life. Be unswerving in your commitment to obey Christ no matter the cost. Be unflinching in your resolve to cling to Christ no matter what suffering may come. So I want to to speak to some some of you groups in here. The the command is to, to be faithful. So, so kids and students in here, I want you to hear. This is Christ's words to you as well. Be faithful. As you walk through school, your job is be faithful. As you go to the ball field, be faithful. Don't believe the lies that everything is telling you to live for popularity, the fun that you can have, anything else. Be faithful. Adults in here, 
This world is pulling at us constantly. It's telling you to live for your job. It's telling you to live for your family. It's telling you to live for the joy and the pleasure of what you can get right here, right now. And it's seducing us to live for an American dream that is not what Christ commands. So, as you go through your day-to-day, as you go to your job, be faithful. Christ says, be faithful. As you live as families, be faithful. As you walk through singleness, be faithful. Be faithful. This is Christ's call to us. But I also want to speak to the older adults in here, some senior adults. He says, be faithful unto death. We never know the day of our death when it may come. We, we may die young, we may die old. The Lord has our days in our hands. But the older we get, we, the, the, we know that our day is coming closer. So I speak to you, senior adults, who you look and you know the day may be coming closer to you. Jesus says, he looks to you and he says, be faithful. Be faithful unto death. And I speak as a 37-year-old man, speaking for a lot of people in here. We, we need to see what it looks like to live faithfully unto death. We need to see what it looks like for senior adults to say, I won't coast through retirement and just get the best I can right now and then go to be the Lord. We need to see senior adults who say that I will, I will live all that I can being faithful unto death. I won't cling to an American dream. I will lay it all down. I will be that prayer warrior. I will give in ministry till my body won't go anymore. This is what we younger folks here in the church need to see, what it looks like to be faithful unto death. So Jesus calls out and speaks to you, speaks to every one of us in here. Be faithful unto death whenever that might come. He calls to us to do that. Third thing he says to hear the word. Hear the word. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It doesn't say to the church. It doesn't say just to Smyrna, but it says to the churches. This is for all to hear. So Jesus calls out to us, says to us right now, hear what the word says. Listen to it. Will you be faithful? Will you not fear? Will you follow after word what the word says? Will you cling to it? Because it's not just about the troubles that they are facing. It's not just about the commands that Jesus gives, but also Christ gives a reward. He comes bring a reward. Listen in verse 10. He says, don't fear all these things that are coming. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life that you've had victory, that you've been faithful until the end. He says, the second death, it won't touch you. Church, these these are words that are not just to a church 2,000 years ago. They are words to us. They're words to you. They're words to me. We hear them sitting in their shoes. We hear them sitting in our shoes right now. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the suffering that may be coming. I don't know the pain that you're experiencing. I don't know exactly what your life looks like, but I do know what Christ says, the response that he demands. Don't fear. Don't fear. Be faithful unto death. This is what the world needs to see. They need to see believers who will be faithful unto death. It is countercultural. It is counter to everything what the world says. Be faithful unto death, church. So this morning, we, we are going to have two times of response, essentially, to this passage. You, you've heard the word. And so here in a minute, the first time of response is through the Lord's Supper. We're going to have the Lord's Supper together, which is an appropriate time for us to, to gather together and for us to remember what Christ has done, to fix our attention on him, to not fear, to be faithful. So as we come to the time of the Lord's Supper, this is a time of examination for us. You've heard the word. Examine your life by the word of what Christ says. Are you walking in faithfulness? Is there fear that is hindering you? We stand firm. 